since this keyword is uh, about sociology, uh, I'll start with um, sociology itself as a word, but for the most part, I'll talk about society and as a keyword within sociology, which is itself then a keyword. Sociology is many things and does many things. And um, I think if you ask people in this room what sociology is or what it does, people will come up with different answers. There are several canonical statements about sociology. And one is by C. Wright Mills, who thinks that sociology is essentially the ability to uh, see the interconnections between biography and history. And as part of that, it needs to be able to make a distinction between uh, the personal private, uh, the private troubles of the milieu and public issues of social structures. And in relation to that, once you start making those distinctions, you realize, as Mill says, that a lot of things that might look like a personal private trouble in fact turn out to be a uh, public issue of social structures. So one, the examples he cites are unemployment, divorce, uh, uh, psychological problems. But we have many examples of that today. Uh, other examples, for, for instance, crime, recidivism, social determinants of health. So health and illness uh, themselves being um, uh, public issues of social structures. There's a sense that um, things happen to people, but those things can in some ways be blamed on society or attributed to social structures. So in the classrooms, we um, often show documentaries to our students where it kind of starts with a personal narrative um, and then, but then it looks at the bigger picture of how did this person end up here. We do this a lot. In the criminal justice system, sometimes people get leniency because of the kind of social circumstances that they come from, um, either from a disorganized neighborhood, from a marginalized group, or uh, so on. This conception, um, as I said, is just one of the existing conceptions. It kind of sounds to me like it might be an American conception, and I'm not very sure about that. Um, so Mills is essentially looking at American sociology in the 1950s. And when he talks about the sociological imagination, he's in a way talking about um, American sociology, sociology as it was done during his time in the US. I can come back to this later, whether this is really a statement about sociology as such. Right now, we are at a crossroads. If we look at sociology in those terms, where on the one hand, we still insist that yes, uh, um, sociology has a mission and is to look at these broader public issues. On the other hand, um, this uh, mission and objective of sociology is challenged. So for instance, cite one uh, famous sociologist, I just chose this randomly uh, because uh, he did an interview when I was writing uh, this paper, uh, Robert Putnam. He says, basically, our, all parts of American society are failing these kids. Poor kids in America to now, compared to 30 years ago, have been ignored and isolated by every major social institution. So blaming society for a certain thing, for failing um, kids. On the other hand, uh, our own former prime minister, Stephen Harper, responded to that a year before, actually, in 2013, saying that, I think, though, it's uh, not the time to commit sociology. And then he went on to say that, for instance, uh, terrorism or the uh, missing and murdered Aboriginal people, uh, women, is, these are not uh, sociological issues. They are crimes um, that should be dealt with within the criminal justice system. And this, of course, goes back to Harper's intellectual and political hero, Margaret Thatcher, who famously said, they are casting their problems on society. And who is society? There is no such thing. There are individual men and women, and there are families. And no government can do anything except through people, and people look to themselves first. It is our duty to look after ourselves and then also to help look after our neighbors. To me, this sounds like classic conservatism, and now it's kind of re-emerged as neoliberalism. Might be the same thing, might not be. I'm not an expert in that area. But within sociology itself, we also have all sorts of accounts of doom and gloom and the 
crisis of sociology and the coming crisis of sociology, uh, which I believe Gomer talks about. People within sociology also questioning um, the current state and the future of sociology and of society itself and does it exist, does it not exist. So what I want to do in the few minutes that I have left is to look at the history of where society comes from as the main object of sociology. Why did it become useful? Hopefully that will point to where we can go from here. I want to tell a story and it's just a story, okay? It's not, you know, a full account of sociology's history. There are two ways in which there are two kinds of narratives about individual and society. One is to say individuals influence society. So this is the classic um, kind of traditional statements that people used to make that, for instance, the elite corrupt society or they lead society. So they can have a positive or negative influence on society around them. So individuals influence society. The reversal of that is to say that society influences individuals. And so one of the things that I'm interested in is how this reversal happened. There are many ways of going about answering that question, and I just have one of those in mind today. I want to say that the discursive break happened somewhere in the 18th and 19th centuries, where it became possible to talk not about how individuals influence society, but to talk about how society influences individuals. And that discursive break depended on um, several changes. So people would write these, for instance, moral essays containing speculative narrative about you know, the elite and what they do and their lifestyle and how that uh, might corrupt society. Essays about etiquette and manners and that sort of thing, ideas of honor, duty. And then that changed in the 19th century, where moral statistics became the dominant uh, perspective. So a, a change happens in, in the style, in the medium of analysis. How do we do the analysis? Is it, are we writing essays, or are we writing moral statistics? Are we dealing with speculation or statistics? Then also a change in the object of analysis, from uh, manners and morality to crime. And so the old essays were about manners and morality and etiquette. The new statistical data was about crime. And then with that, a change in uh, sort of how these explanations took place. So uh, in the old style of writing, it, it, it was about free will. These elite could choose to be good or they could choose to be corrupt. But now in the statistical writing, uh, moral uh, social determinism was emerging as a new explanation. And then there was also a change in the subjects of analysis. What was, who was being analyzed? Who was being studied? And it went from the elite to the poor. And then also a change in the subject or the author of analysis, so subject with a capital S. And that's the rise of the bourgeoisie in the, um, under the guise of statistical societies, for instance, in England, who began studying the poor people and their problems. It is in this that I locate a historical break that happened where um, it became possible to talk about um, society as something that you can blame for certain things, for the things that individuals do or things that happen to individuals rather than the other way around. And the nice thing about this new discursive device, which is society, is that it allowed the bourgeoisie, which were you know, bankers and industrialists who were in these statistical societies, to then say, well, it's society's fault. It's not our, our fault anymore. They were the new elite, right? And they wanted to take no responsibility at all for what was happening. It's society's fault. So it became a convenient, essentially, excuse. To, and it's vague enough that you can just project whatever you want into it. I have uh, some quotations here. Um, kind of looking at the differences between uh, the kind of old ass moral essays about, um, about morality, um, where, for instance, John Brown writes in uh, 1757, and he's a very influential figure because once he wrote his estimate of the manners and principles of the time, everybody else started writing like that. And so he talks about the manners of the leading classes and saying that it's characterized by a vain, luxurious, and selfish effeminacy. 
And people were really attracted to this kind of writing because essentially this was a time when the British had a um, kind of a series of military setbacks against the French. The question was, how did this happen? Why can't we defeat them? And so in order to answer that question, they looked at the elite and how our elite are our elite uh, have become too accustomed to luxuries because of increased commerce and wealth in society, and how that leads them to effeminacy, lower fertility, and therefore military weakness. What the poor did was a side question in, in these narratives. On the other hand, then you had moral statistics with people like, for instance, people who are in here in criminology know it better than me, Rawson, W. Rawson in 1839, looking at um, masses of people in poor urban areas. You can't expect anything out of these people other than crime and immorality because of their circumstances. So he was looking at social determinants of crime, age, sex, occupation, population, density, ethnicity, education, and other people after him, like Fletcher. Um, Ketley in France was a big um, intellectual hero for these guys in England. The idea was that now the, the new big threat is not the French, it's our own people. And to find explanations for why they are committing so many crimes, you have to look not at the elite, which in this case is the, is the bankers and the industrialists, uh, but you have to look at society. So it becomes this convenient device to project all sorts of problems into it. It essentially became an ideological construct for the governance of the poor. In recent decades, for instance, we have seen the emergence of community as a new category for analysis and intervention and governance of uh, ordinary people. Uh, the point I want to make in a quick conclusion is that um, if we, whether society can survive as a discursive device, I don't know. Uh, is it going to be supplanted by something else like community? I have no idea. But if it does, I don't think it will be a huge crisis and it's not going to be a fatal blow to sociology if we say, okay, society doesn't exist, as some people have, have argued, whether in the political arena or in, the, in academia. It doesn't matter because what matters is for us to have a, a device through which we can explain the problems that we want to explain, whether that's society or community or something else, doesn't matter. The mistake that we need to avoid making is to then go and consider this discursive device as existing, um, as Durkheim said, sui generis, uh, on its own, in itself, having a reality. And I think it would be more fruitful to say, well, this is just a device that we have to look at these problems that we have and offer solutions, rather than to say, for instance, society exists sui generis on its own, in itself, or community exists um, sui generis. So, yeah. All right.